Okay, well, welcome everyone to the, this uh, uh, black box uh, reading. Um, I, I wonder if everyone could sort of mute themselves um, uh, 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 so that uh, um, we don't get any interference. Um, if you could sort of manually uh, mute yourself. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, welcome to the to the to this uh, black box manifold uh, reading. It's also a centre, a Sheffield centre for poetry, poetics reading. Um, the the evening grows out of a, a section of the current issue of Black Box Manifold, uh, curated by John Goodby, on Welsh uh, innovative poetry, uh, and uh, features work by David Anoon, Zoe Brigley Thompson, Gwynevere Clark, Ian Davidson, Lyndon Davis, Neil Davis, and Amy uh, Amy McCauley, Lee Duggan, Peter Finch, David Greenslade, Margaret Hannigan Pop, Stephen Hitchens. Uh, Natalie Ann Holborough, and Matthews, Robin Menhinnick, Rhea Seren Phillips, Zoe Scolding, and Neris Williams. And thanks to all those poets for their fantastic work, and uh, um, and to John for his, his the great uh, uh, job he did curating it, but for also for his uh, excellent introduction. Uh, I'll, I'll put a um, a black book black box uh, link uh, into chat uh, in a in a while. Um, if, if any of you want to use the chat function, please do. Um, it's it's a sort of fun way to to um, in this kind of eerie world of Zoom uh, to to make your, your feelings um, uh, known, as it were. Um, as John was such a, a fine curator of the black box uh, section, um, I've inveigled him uh, into the job to, of introducing um, the, the three first. Uh, poets from the section uh, in Black Box uh, that we, ha we have lucky to read uh, for us this evening. It's rare, Saren Phillips, Neris Williams, uh, Lyndon Davies. Um, and uh, after their readings, um, I I'll, I'll be uh, coming in and uh, introducing John. So I'm uh, so handing uh, over to you, John. Great, thanks, Adam. Um... And, and you know, thanks for making the special issue uh, feature possible, and for um, you know having the the faith in in the work and and you know my curatorial abilities to to actually allow us to have this space in the uh, Centre for Poetry and Poetics reading tonight. It's it's a, it's an honour, and um, you know I, I I'm really appreciate um, what what you've what you've done and what Aggie has done. In, in making us all feel so welcome. Um, you basically introduced the poets, uh, as it were, in their you know, current manifestation in Black Box. I just want to say one or two words about the, the, the kind of run up to that very, very briefly. I met Lyndon over 10 years ago now at a very unsatisfactory reading I gave in a tent on the fringes of the uh, Hay Literature Festival, which I think had an audience of two legitimate uh, uh, people. The rest were apparatchiks from uh, Literature Wales. And we decided we could do a little bit better than that. And we started up something called uh, the Hay Jamboree with um, Graham and Penny, Graham Hartle and uh, Penny Hallis uh, helping us out. Um, and we ran that for four years. Um, and we put innovative Welsh poetry, I think, on the map in our way. Other people had done it and were doing it as, as well. Ian Davidson um, and Zoe Scolding in North Wales, for example, along with others. But we played our part. And out of that, about six years after the last Jamboree in 2012, came this thing, The Edge of Necessary, which I suppose is the uh, forerunner of the feature in Black Box Manifold an anthology of innovative Welsh poetry, 1966 to 2018. We unearthed some very interesting kind of alternative strands and histories uh, for Welsh poetry. What happened to experimental poetry in Wales after Dylan Thomas and Lynette Roberts and David Jones? That's basically what that book is about. So really now, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce the first of the readers. I'm doing this alphabetically but it's, it's, I think, right that uh, the alphabet is working in our favour tonight to make Lyndon the first of the readers. Um, 
Lyndon's been very prolific recently. These are just a couple of his latest productions. The materials, um, reset. Um, he's just finished a magnificent long poem called Mont Saint Jean. Uh, and he's going to read tonight, he tells me, from a poem in the same form, um, allotments. I don't know how many people are aware of this, but a lot of uh, poets have allotments and um, they've been cultivating them over the period of the pandemic and Lyndon is among them. So I will hand over to him now, Lyndon. Thanks, John. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me? Can I be heard? Yeah, okay. Well, first to say thanks very much to Black Box Manifold and the Shef Sheffield Center for Poetry and Poetics and to John as well for inviting me to read. Um, I'm gonna to stick to the poems that were in Black Box Manifold, uh, that sequence called An Allotment. Um, I'll be leaving some of the poems out and including uh, a few newer ones if I find there's time. <clears throat> Uh, I started writing this sequence at the start of the first lockdown. We just acquired an allotment and we spent a lot of time down there and it was like being in an enchanted landscape. Very peaceful, very beautiful and yet tinged with threat. I started thinking about the world of the Midsummer Night's Dream, which has its dark side of course, and some poems started coming which linked that with the everyday uncanny goings on on the allotment. Uh, there are many thematic currents running through the sequence, amongst them memories of earlier times when a similar kind of quietness reigned in suburban streets, uh, a time very much not without its own generalized forms of threat. Uh, just before I start, just to say, if, if you haven't got the text before you, you might be slightly startled by the repeated use of the word hall. I thought it worth saying just to maintain the proprieties, that the spelling of this word varies between H-A-W in the first case and H-O-A-R in the second. <clears throat> An allotment. Mugged ripe for the setup, sorcerers spinning itch through high weather in blight hall, once cordially explicable messages sting half wild, even dumber in my ears hall by the plot waver, fitted skew as to purpose, Listening just and watching now into growth, but hardly yet a wisp or a whisper, wedged close, neat, in chivied, suppled half inch top of it. Only that one stuck, had sovereignty over my intent, lit up her joints trilling, rice sot for a churl's muzzle of shaped latex or whatever it took in the way of normal. Forced other as part animal, somehow at home, but home nobbled sideways and just lightly fringed with nightmare in the tinge, leveled down resilient, rocked us in our own defeat, desire in the very setup. Several kinds of injury dibbed in this swelling plush, each chuckle of crocked pulse, what mischief in a feedback noose. Axis materially out of kilter, bites yellow spot in the infant terrible deficiency of some kind, or overproduction of clement hormones, air of the serried trees, packs mold in our bubble, free as the night, free as the killing wands, a wave and it lifts us. Never quite cleanly rebutting subtle yammer at the palace, saw matter of a gap, who dares what and why, where was it uttered from, no recorded narrative, just a bead dropping, half crushed from wood's mangle, there where the trauma bit, imposition of fraught energies, squared off here and squared away under mesh, its apparel flawless as a weaver's dream of summer, if summer came new, Whatever came before considers you from its rubric, slope beveled by flood rip. How were the gods measured then from any riverbed and a spate? Just wait until it settles, far blunt thunder of rolled stones, no wit to coax anything new until the torrent fades. Slim contract for your parcel, admittedly, and the sticks won't grip, won't penetrate. Is a scratch sufficient? Blessing to be folked by the airy. 
Suddenly everyone about as lost as they could be, but still according to a pattern of polytests, algorithmically resolvable, cooked reckoning of implied dues, if any lacked left a residue, stamp continuous and the file administratively complete, although dog-eared in a registry, some human fallout, but the record steady, comforting when that whale leaks insidious on the other side of a boundary marked legal. Fell humming out of sync and humour out of variable dazzle, mocked lineage whose cued cells witch into curl or astounded openness, more or less where we thumb them, clumsy once in glad fetter, or misfires with originary fervour, awake then, the tools sprouting, histories of translation and return, are the nymphs rising, fleet in the water tanks and descending, deep out of sight, deep into sight, rising. Spark flitting through golden trailer parks of crimped cirrus, the line forks to accommodate each shift, still branching as night quickens, unzipping its gaunt cicatrice of velocities, I lie down into nowhere and the fault starts, all racked in its steeping nest of low fraught melodies, every mission of the stemmed mas messenger into the heart of panic, blithely tearing us now where we thought, God help us, it had come to tickle. Stirring up felons of all kinds in the leery dark, ruination of fine cloth, neither cruel nor human, except in the telling of it, making light of weakness in the property hedge drilling through or under it or gliding over as the whimsy takes them, fun for the nagging tribes of midnight but the ripples growing ever faster and more destructive the further out they travel. <clears throat> Not even pausing to consider by the time the wake hits, trounced in its midden splash of offerings, any reason to remain even partly calm, strung up in the wires, listening at both ends of the equation, distance as breaking flush of speculative intimacies, not quite as immaculate as displayed on the packet, but still illustrative of what it could have meant to live in a platonic universe. That last wail of the one stolen, once hers, yes, but carried through by witness, an event less event now than transformation into submerged continuum of the sacred. It's the one seeing who suffers, bodying it raw for the others, but all that has already founded or pushed through into surface, a tableau of poised attributes on the crumb, spear and wing and knob and pagoda as if something is being figured. From air and to air, what history and then the stirring hum of somebody knowing something I don't, could I ever, framed in a heady landscape, decorous in part resemblance to all previous versions of itself. This disturbs me elsewhere than I was once, those seductive ridges, pulsing with interrogation of their place in the woolly scheme, and hours curving round, consolatory without confirmation. Baked in, that's the cant, still wrestling to get outside, who's pelt here, but I couldn't quite shift for some other right, battening in my muddled ear. Itch rattled me, but such sweet sounds tripped from the sod underpassed by the mole and the thieving mouse into full sun or later into dark, still audible inside and the outside nowhere to be felt, but here with a stranger's touch, shaping a stranger touched. Could have prowled redly, shaken with a golden roar, reductive of condominiums, stood on the plot blocking ingress and egress. Each of these has its hole running through at the terminal. Through oceanic plasm, this lover gapes as material witness, but only to a bright remnant, a squint at the grievance, a blink through a crack in a solemn book, 
in a glade, in a universe, in a book. Despite friendly acts, getting spooked by the brawly crows, some little snapping imp down there at a limit ditch, or past even calling scarecrow, jolts looks so much like its maker. I mean, look, and then all these bristlings going on, all these spurrings, no one ever had to worry about when the joint jumped. Couldn't have imagined anything as quiet as this inside all that. So that what just slipped past quietly or seen to without notice turns out to contain the crystal, peas blossom, cobweb, twin bastions of the running ditch. No point keeping watch. A fish jumps or a star erupts when and where it must. Looking down into forage, I missed everything I'd thought, but the radium was spilling its own Christmas blush over these rough bunched stalks, thrown back as I lay flummoxed. Tassels and dinky bats, glaucous flags of the state of magic, lodged swelling under uprush, spires of a bidden jewel, many low mounds egging themselves into prophecy or assumed, some clues there if we could just be patient in the midst of travel, blind atrophy and attack by unspecified alien adventurers, keeping our sky burials under wraps until we know who's giving the eulogy. All soaking in by capillary action, down the hairs and along the unspoken leads, even this clogged pre-intentional nature takes a hit for nature now, thoroughly stuffed with required nutrients, moistures of Zeus or Moloch, it is all energy and reserve for a spate of clowning excess. If the hat doesn't fit, cut your bloody ears off. If the shoe doesn't fit, cut your bloody toes off. Grim, isn't it? Eyes in the green woods smart, each living its new normal, inextricably before the old arrived where they'd ever thought it should. So none of this adds up. Put down the steady cam, let's have bumps in the film. Even effigies need to shake out a cramp occasionally. It's quite normal for reality to go full ass over tip on a raised paving slab. Your blood on the lichen limbed horizontal face of Elvis. In effect, inexplicable, indecipherable, or at least impossible to untangle cleanly. And that is the story. Further complicated by sudden color shifts, weaving in, who'd have thought you could eat monkey puzzle nuts? Fatigue has its store. Glands fattening in a leathern sheath as maps fall in a flurry from the bowers that mothered us. All this for a wary onset, but the toll unforeseeable. At the edge of measure, gift recognized as gift, what's coaxed from the furnace, broached by a sallow mite or multi-mythical destroyer, spun from the iron core to this altar weaving illiterate enzymes into pulp and fiber, just left to be taken up as flavor of a million flailing galaxies come to roost in a drowsy rite, in a comic augury charred on a pot bottom. Thank you very much. That's about it. Then. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Lynn. Terrific. That's great. Thank you. Um, next up is Ria Phillips. And Ria used to be um, a student of mine at uh, Swansea University back in the day. She was a master's student and then a PhD student in creative writing. Um, and she is just one of those people who comes to you with a fully formed style as a teacher and who you, you simply just sit back and say, get on with it. There's nothing I can teach you. You're, you're teaching me. Really. Uh, and Rhea had uh, and has an amazing style, which is based us around um, representing Welsh uh, medieval uh, forms, Kanganeth forms in English, but that's only the start of it. This is a, 
a jagged, muscular, uh, disruptive poetry, which delights in footnotes, among other things, and font mixtures. These probably won't be discernible or all of them uh, in tonight's reading. Um, but um, it's extraordinary poetry. It's extraordinary poetry. Uh, and it's a bridge between two poetic cultures as well. It works to um, perform a cultural uh, service, as it were, and I know Rhea sees it that way, as well as uh, putting out aesthetic objects into, into the literary world. So enough said, um, and it's over to Rhea. Uh, I don't know if she's going to read from her book. This was published recently, just to give it a, a little bit of a push, Grandiloquent Wretches, but she'll explain all of that, I'm sure, Rhea. Thank you, John, and thank you for um, supporting my work, Black Box. It's a, it's a privilege to be part of it. I do have um, Brendan Alcondrettes with me as well. <laughs> but, uh, before I begin, can everyone hear me properly? Yep, awesome. I'm going to start with three poems from uh, that were published in Black Box Manifold in its 25. The first one is about my time as a sales assistant working in home bargains in one of the probably worst areas of Connectly. So we got a lot of very different types of people in. So what some of these people would do is they would um, hide a loaf of bread under their jacket and they would pay for another item. So it kind of looked like they weren't stealing because they were going through the tell process. And they often will pay in pennies. And I felt so awful that even though I knew they were stealing, I would just leave them go. Um, I mean, to get a lot of regulars doing it. So this poem is about, about a regular in particular. But in da tarkinigog adig and virtur. Hulk crackled lips, flecked with scarlet tibbury. Edged by ginger snap dad of skin, an ebullion snifter skittered hair footed into a thicket of aisles. Emerged triumphant with trapping hands, deftly, deftly drilling barrows of thread, leavening with fireworks beards. The hen gunpowder drowns white noise, solid drunken silence. The second poem is called Tacadia. Sorry, said the sparrow, crested cream and steel eyed for all, all, all syrup, you soon syrup. I told the souls to cry with their inside voices, pocket their grief and roll it between finger and thumb into the lacnet frost. Breath misfires as locatus isoplets, stolen Emma. A third same birds glitz and galley to the strain of sapphire signals, a mechanical tilt, a sodium vibrate thins elements to sides. A laconic clock of hollows, racked with tremors, thinning the nausea deforming the Texas within. Uh, the next poem has been inspired by a quote by Brian Friel between um, the master of the teeth tooth in the head school, Manit, and one of the students who said, it's easier to stamp out learning than recall it. So this poem is called when asked what my basal ganglia learned today, sniff the hair's breath, axion to recall it. Chlorine plume, basks peak eyes, transmit chloride and sate its brine. Rhizomatic, backed cradle buttered horn, dogmatic over granular nescient misfit. School is no place for higher thought. Submit electric impulses 
a close outwit control traps. Hoodwink, an impaired somatic, peculiarity at static. Overwrought punted, quaff from its gill slit. Marine glistening with dew and moonlit. Anthracite ore sequined by enigmatic drills. Note the herbatic expansion to the peculiarity of static. Uh, the next poem I want to read out is, um, has been recently published elsewhere. Um, and it's called The Speckled Way in Which to Live Like a Maggot in Bacon. Tenderize the cranium with silver tanned boots, calcified babby soft and bruised of all. Reduce all to pulp, papillae's boiling to crack phosphorus, wit into dunity, contused nostalgia, scintillated, asphyxiated, petrichor, the tanny, sap, and herbal bone of deep birds remain steaming. Damp flanzies agitate the leaves of selonium, like copersicon, to invigorate in slumber. Erupting nicotine aroma, adipose wilting, awful lumbers on the border of an unmarked road, thickened by self clouds of blossoming iris, a crackling fire of plum and copper angus. And the next poem is called Eager for Normality to Embitter the Belly. Corrugated scallop intestines, exact foreign mucus within the bile duct. Traitorous bastard metal, said matter the like claret silk, embittered aching swell, pop pin and scritzing sentience. Sadders fade and distort. A culico in great scale threats the gut till it gave its way and abandoned all cylinders. Anaesthetized morning, stricken to a rich scent of liver, frying raw, delicious, to bark black. Ensnared its free in biscuits, rainbow kefir, scaled gunnel. For the, for the break in field of sack. Darkling around a better and bitter aval, not untwisted, exposed to greater organ, you with crunch to the infested. And the final two poems were recently published uh, by the Literary Pocket Book. And I'll tell you quickly because it's a very, very pretty book. And you can play with it as well. I know Dom probably won't mind me selling it a little bit. <laughs> but it's two poems in one and you can kind of make them into one long one. So it's quite fun. But, um, these two poems are about the reclamation of an identity following a traumatic experience. And a lot of my poems, like the Cardia, I use um, quotes from modern fiction. Like there's a quote from a series of unfortunate events in that one. And this one has particularly been influenced by fan fiction. I won't tell you which ones because they're quite bad. But, and uh, personal experiences as well. So this is called How to Moor a Porcelain Urton. This intervention strikes a nauseating rapport. Supertidal and intertidal zones veer in pause cupped hands. Abraded with wrought spittle depths. They must fix the vortex at sand concaves. Absconding the mantle of the earth then, exposing the harrow dress beneath. More serin, snag its mind, make it stop in the sky. Course rivets into fizzers, and ingurgitating of rifts. Sweet and paste, caffeinated for the duration. We are the adhesive that anchors us together. It regrets the regurgitation of corkscrew scales that reveals brands 
initials for anonymity. Fixated on my shadow, I came full circle. Fleeced by the sea, I came back to you, a deformed hole. And the final poem I'd like to read is called Masters Out of It with Their Brand. Oxidized scarlet crooks, ripe for uprooting. Preserved casualty of this opaque wall, that vernal rats had to be left behind. Polychromatic pockmarks wrapped under cloth. Irks the monster inside to respect them. Labored at stern, this analytic gut has fettered to iron. Cords, cords quarry an oath to itself, so bold and spineless that echo a cadaver is flawed by its candidates, to ponderance to grasp. Requited me within your palate, petrified deserving desolation constrains its timorous voice in mistrust. I am, I am, I am not the basal. Wealth of peace the healing wants to do them. Burned at the ensam into knotted skin, stricken by the convulsion of silkworms. Hair footed winsome, his barrows is froze, then a burst crack of ire causes a monster. Underneath flats and between bone, a lamb screams daddy. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ria. Terrific stuff. Thank you. It's fabulous. Um, and so we come to uh, the third the third reader, uh, Neris Williams. And Neris uh, now works at uh, University College Dublin in Ireland and uh, lives in Cowles. But she's originally from uh, near Carmarthen. Um, she's a Welsh speaker. Um, she's published uh, several books, um, one with the uh, leading Welsh um, poetry publisher Seren Books, um, and also another one with an Irish press, the New Dublin Press, that's um, Cabaret. Uh, the work that she produced for the, um, the Black Box Manifold uh, special, however, is a, a new sequence that she tells me she's been working on for quite some time now, several years, which are a series of prose poems um, that reach back to that uh, Welsh past and particularly at a time uh, growing up there. And you will pick up, I think, uh, if she reads any of them, I'm trying not to preempt, um, references to 1980s, 1990s um, culture. Uh, I can't give any more away because I don't know any more, um, but I'm really pleased and proud to uh, be able to introduce Neris tonight. So over to you, Neris. Great. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I know how much work goes into this, but um, particularly also to John and Lyndon for all your support over the years as well. Um, but it's lovely to be here with a black box manifold crew. Um, if I can say that, I sound a bit kind of I'm trying to be youth, but um, I've just spent today in a meeting with 122 people on Zoom all talking in kind of weird academic language that I didn't quite understand. So it's really nice to be hearing. Um, Hearing creativity on the ear then. I'm just going to frame this a little bit. The volume is kind of tentatively called um, Republic. I'm just going to read uh, maybe five poems from it. Um, but just to give you a framing a little bit, I don't want to over explain it because I'm basically telling stories. There's nothing much to explain. Um, so these prose scatterings then began from a need to commit, I felt, an oral history to paper, stories that were told, overheard, handed down, mostly in Welsh. It was no coincidence that these prose poetry sections began as a response to the imminent UK referendum in 2016. So many of the sections are attempts to sift through my relationship to Welsh as a minority language and understand what others make of linguistic difference. Um, many of the sections were written against a background of increasing attacks, especially on social media made against the Welsh language. And it, indeed, it still seems to be a time when anything culturally different to an imagined consensus, whatever that might be, 
is presented as a drain on resources or threat to stability. So I just set myself a real basic rule. I was kind of plagiarizing um, Lynn Ginian's My Life, um, but just to give myself 20 sentences. And the paragraph was a unit of thought, and it enabled me to depart into a bit more play, sometimes even humor. Um, and what I found was, and I'm sure that everybody here is fully aware of this, but rule-governed writing offers such a paradoxical freedom and um, the format enabled writing to begin again and again, um, to borrow from Stein. Um, and rules oddly generate chance associative word patternings, also make for narrative errancies. And The Republic, um, it's a very tentative title, but it's my experience of naturalization, Irish citizenship, and also the possibilities, I hope, of a nation looking at itself from afar with a bit of wry independence. So I've set myself up for a fall there, I think, but let's start off. Um, okay, anti-memoirist. And I'm reading the poems that are in the, um, the issue. It has to be of the place. It has to retain movement, not be nostalgic nor indulgent. It has to write itself, the process of making, whether that might be the taste of orange spilt on chin or explosive Coke cans showering children in the back of the bus. It has to tell the truth about speaking a language that is constantly under threat, first from its own people, then the Quangos, and finally, by a lack of conviction and hurt. It has to tell more than a story of an individual, a community, not the saccharine loss found in mediocre memoirs. It has to tell of the feathery feeling that once met as life becomes love. It has to tell of the small vial of tears that you keep on a shelf its cut glass catches the sun. It has to tell the story of oil and sweat and broken down things repaired, remastered, then sold. This might be the story of smoke, how smoke curls into the lungs to be blown into punctuation marks in the sky. This might be the story of small things becoming bigger and punctured by a lack of insight. This might be the story of an old record player that crackles. It is painted a deep blue. Its speakers drop in and out. The music becomes a background noise of feed in and feed back. Can you complete the loop of a disturbed song? This might be the telling of more than one life, how lives intersect, are borrowed, are tried on like big mothballed fur coats in boxes on cupboards. This might be the big strip tease, a series of a life in objects. The pen you found on a dresser. The woman with the swimsuit once turned, her breast slip out as the ink slides down. The woman's expression is the same a forced smile of tedium. Please, dear reader, let this not be me. The next title I think is the closest I've ever got to Kanghanith, maybe Kanghanith sign, um, Dada in Pontardawe. You were watching your favorite band, Dat Blagi, sampling a hairdryer. David R. Edwards is making the audience wait, sound looped back into the synthesizer, creating the backing track for Christian and a kibbutz. It has taken time and persuasion to get here, a road off the M4 to Swansea, zipping past new industrial estates, post miners strike, opened by a conservative minister in the Welsh office, flanked by Labour councillors, too young to drive, too young to drink, your friend sisters agree to get you to a community centre in Pontar Dawe. You all scream with laughter round and round about twice. You think how young women arrange events but never perform. Preparing for gigs is cabaret, taking up the hem of a 60s psychedelia, marshalling the confidence of a red PVC Mac or borrowing a father's choir tux before vintage became a knowing wood. No mention of cigarette smoke or whiskey breath in the pickup. This experiment is part of the fabric of keeping Welsh contemporary. Dat Blagi 
pen a song bar hoir, late bar, to taunt a hostile, drunken audience. Dadaism and anarchy, the pertinent challenge to a respectability that haunts Welsh culture. Finding albums entails research. You explore music through political pamphlets and post your SAEs, Liz's head upside down. During O-level revision, the doorbell rings, your mother ushers in a friend. It is Pat, that Bluggy's bassist on her way to Thomas's boathouse, delivering an LPU ordered. Shyly, you both sit on the patio, trying to find words to tell how much music means. The dark humour of West Wales against raw guitar and insistent keyboards, how you chant on a daily basis. Nadine Dall and Julia am Wyth. Testing these assertions against your tongue, reviews in the enemy littered with analogies to Tom Jones and male voice choirs, but Barron's illusions open up a new archive, framing opportunities hungered for. Anger in the baseline in Public Image Limited, ludic repost in the fall, combative drone in the Jesus and Mary chain, lyrics as agitation for Patti Smith. That shift from the solitary I to a shared possibility born in the language you love but resent. Superglue. Having a crush is mesmerizing, an illness, memorializing encounters, staring in the mirror half smiling. It's attractive impossibility that nothing happens is a key pleasure. One wills the beloved into being, Walking across the street, you hold your head to avoid it tumbling. The thought cloud which might disclose its full frame of reference. A pain so scarlet, it fills the head and heart with shame. Do I own the crush or does the crush own me? It might be the making of a gesture, the holding of one's chin, the satisfaction of admiring the way a beloved walks or smiles or touches the side of their face thinking and how to disguise it. Never tell your friend. Avoid your crush with friends. They will make you wince with self-consciousness. Never take a big-mouthed Yorkshire man to a poetry reading if your crush is performing. He will draw attention, refusing to pay, eating all the artful hors d'oeuvres, and talk loudly about the frail, anxious listeners. The delicate sensibility of the crush bearer willing other worlds into being. You go to a thrift store and buy a red dress with a flurry of scalloped layers. It reminds you of Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera in canvas. You might accessorize this dress with army boots and a rucksack. There might be the desire to perform your curious hybrid, breathing in Welsh, speaking English. Because of poetry, you take a broken violin case and make a HD memorial a bricolage of dried grasses, seashells, spent pesos. Superglued also is a mirror with three dead wasps nesting into a dried rose. Tea Hearth. And this translates, of course, as summer house. Um, I was quite shocked, actually. Um, it is reported that almost 40% of property sold in Gwynedd, North Wales, between March 2019 and April 2020 were purchased, purchased as second homes. So this was um, figures from the Welsh Revenue Authority. A similar problem, obviously, in um, the west coast of Ireland as well. Tihav. This story starts the year the Cocteau Twins release Heaven or Las Vegas. You saw Grange Mask's colours, the chemical plant, and inspiration for the 4 AD record cover, though you never shared this information until now. The year you get to know the owner of the second home near your village. She's researching a PhD, has made friends with your grandmother, walking down to the shop between periods of writing. Your grandmother tells her about your A-level results, how you are studying English with film far away. The woman is surprised that you go to university. She's not patronising. She was a housewife, the good wife of a somebody who worked in a global auction house and a mother of three. For a smoker, the daily journey to your grandmother's shop is ritual. 
Back one summer, this time about to fly to study in California, before the interview, your friend told you not to look at the man in the middle of the panel. He was astigmatic. Swearing not to use the word invigorate, you promptly did. You're invited to an afternoon party at the second home. Walking close to hedgerows to the farmhouse, once home to a doctor's skeleton that is now buried in the field. While you are hungry for discussions of Akhmatova, you are spectacle in a cabaret of curiosities. These people mean well with their cheese, biscuits, wine and olives, but it seems derisory that the milking parlour is now a games room. They are polite, tell you things about a California you have yet to see. Something, however, screams inside, throwing imaginary typewriters against the newly pointed limestone walls. You want to cut the green bays of the snooker table with a sturdy kitchen knife. And finally, I'm going to close with the first poem I've ever written with happy as a title. Happy in language. While we walk the estuary, dull January, my friend tells me in a recent UK poll on accents that we are considered the unsexiest. The same poll notes that they are also the happiest sounding. The country that I now live has the most attractive accent, who cannot resist a little Irish brogue. On this trip, another friend tells me that Candethas have lost the campaign to retain university halls as a Welsh speaking environment. But it's being reported as a victory, I say. He shakes his head, explains the intricacies of funding. Renovations have been given to a global consortium who will sell this capital asset to the highest bidder. Who knows which corporation will own the building once the heart of political action? Certainly not the institution. Near the estuary, I reminisce how we were introduced because of our shared language laughing because we both feared that initial meeting done out of politeness to English friends. Normally, we did not seek out exilic communities. We wondered at the homogenization that accent in the article implied. She has words for objects and I have other words. Can the monolingual ear not discern a shift from region, area, north, south, east to west? Possibly it relishes that deafness. Yet, is able to discern the blend of a coffee, a wine's vintage, a sample and a dance track, but hears us all as same in our unsexiness. My mentor could discern the difference between the most intricate of literary theories, but was surprised that trains traveled to my market town. Showing little curiosity about spaces of linguistic difference on that small island off the European mainland. We chatted eagerly about the group of linguistically innovative poets who challenged the status of public language, never speaking of my own bilingualism as a way of understanding idiolectical practices. I dreamt of the complexity of my language is acidic in their enunciation to create a language whose very difference inspires revolt. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Neris, Dielkenbauer. That's fantastic. Um, and a worthy conclusion, making us happy in language. Um, I now hand back to Adam, who will then hand to me, I think. Yes. <laughs> yeah, th thanks, Neris, that was, that was fantastic. Um, it's, a, it's, it's my great pleasure to, to um, uh, introduce John Gooby. Um, uh, is uh, actually w working here in Sheffield. Um, uh, we're very lucky uh, so that he's become a Sheffielder for for a while at least, um, uh, and brought the, his sort of a, a, a immense genial uh, knowledge and wit to to, to this city. <laughs> and and is like a, a incredible knowledge of, of the of the great poet um, Dylan Thomas. Uh, the the Irish connection. Uh, that Neris was talking about is important to him as well. It, um, he has a, a book about Irish poetry um, since 1950, which looked at McGreevy, Coffey, Galvin, uh, lo lots, lots of uh, great voices. 
uh, but it's um, it's that uh, is the work in Dylan Thomas, which has been uh, amazing with the, with the monographs and the and the centenary edition and the fifth and the, and uh, uh, very recently the, the extraordinary fifth notebook that's been discovered, um, which is edited with Adrian Osborne. Um, his work on, on Thomas it, it just insists on on him as a, as a high modernist as as, as well as. Uh, the, the the extraordinary poet that, that we all uh, know, and that, that that's puts him right the, at the heart of uh, European modernism uh, and, and world modernism, really, really in really excellent ways. And I, and I think that his monograph, um, I'm I'm really grateful to for the for the attention to the um, uh, to Thomas and the war and the, and the Cold War. Um, uh, but it was, it's here as a poet that we, we, we uh, attending to him, and, and his, his poetry collections uh, include uh, un, uh, this is a, a, the Thomas collection as well, Uncaged Sea with Waterloo, Waterloo Press, uh, um, which is uh, a Cajun mesostic rewriting of the collected poems. Uh, <laughs> sounds amazing. Um, and uh, uh, P uh, Peter Finch has a, uh, had a great review of this. Thomas, Thomas thrust into the postmodern maelstrom, pulled by process, mashed by manipulation, and riveted by rearrangement. <laughs> um, uh, 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 more recently, though, we've got Elenium with uh, Shearsman, which is a cut up sonnet se sequence, which sort of um, uh, uh, draws on uh, social sh shame and uh, uh, other embarrassing emotions, and then the the no uh, no breath uh, red ceilings collection, um, uh, which is just sort of lyric lyric fragments of very great beauty. Uh, he's also published translations of Pasolini, Heine, Reverdi, and uh, Algerian poet Suleiman Abdel um, Adel Guemar with Tom Cheeseman, and uh, as he as he. Uh, showed to you he's also an editor with uh, uh, Lyndon Davis of the Edge of Necessary, uh, a really important intervention into the world pre presenting as the, the black box section does uh, innovative Welsh, Welsh poetry. Um, so uh, over to you, John. Thanks, Adam, for that, that fabulous introduction. I uh, hope I can <laughs> live up to it. I sometimes feel when I'm writing my poetry, um, to quote one of the epigraphs I used in Elenium um, from John Wieners, uh, that all I do is I just write down the most embarrassing thing I can think of. That was his uh, answer when asked uh, how he wrote his poetry. I hope I'm not going to embarrass anyone here too much tonight, but I tend to just work on ideas as they, as they come to me and then stack them away without um, without completing them and that's been the curse of my academic existence overcome now I think slightly at least because of the new role I have which doesn't involve me in teaching and administrative work and this is at Sheffield Hallam as um, as Adam pointed out at Sheffield Hallam University the competitor as it were institution <laughs> of Sheffield University not really um, and during the pandemic, I found I've had even more time to um, consider what I actually do as a poet. One of the things it's resulted in is writing longer. And again, I hope this isn't too much of a burden on people tonight. I've tended to start writing in sequences and to think of larger units. So tonight I'm going to read from two pieces um, which are sequences which are conceived as, as, as rather grand things, as it were, um, although obviously I won't be able to read them in toto. Um, and the first one I'm going to, to read from is the one that uh, Black Box Manifold, issue 25, uh, published sections from, sections one and two, and this is called Young Aims. Um, a little bit difficult to explain totally what's going on, but uh, really it's just about my own um, upbringing, background in Birmingham, using the figure of my best friend at uh, Infants and Juniors, uh, a lad called Ames. Um, and the coincidence of his name with um, uh, a, a pot-boiling American novel, which I came across uh, 
in a second-hand bookshop called Young Ames, uh, published in 1941. And it's a historical novel set in um, New York between 1833 and 1836. And it charts the meteoric rise to fame of a young clerk in a kind of shipping company in New York, whose name is John Ames, um, which unites myself and my friend Nigel Ames, John Goodby Nigel Ames, in his own single name. So this is a poem which is a kind of epic. It's in 12 books or sections. There are 11 chapters in the book. I had to cheat slightly and divide uh, the seventh chapter in two to get the epic 12. And it runs from our first, uh, as it were, encounter, both stricken with measles uh, in uh, the road, holding our mother's hands, through to the time when I went off to university. Um, and there are various um, matchings between the, um, the epic structure uh, as classically uh, inherited and what happens in our lives. So for example, an acid trip that we both had in, at the age of 17 becomes the descent into Hades uh, in um, the Aeneid. Um, and as Neris said, using a method, a system to create a poem throws up all sorts of uh, freedoms and coincidences that one can exploit. So without any further ado, I'm going to read the second section of Young Ames, which appears in Black Box Manifold. Sipping his matutinal milk monitors, both filling the desk boxes, unaccountable, unjustifiable, as cautious as treacle, on a frosty morning going to pieces of lallygagging and loafing alphabetically on their two wires, returned to his desk, glissade the long slide shadow side of the playground hut. He clattered down the stairs, skylight lead, querulous, swung low, a big wind making up, squake tight on the new snow, with its bones bare for the wind. Young Ames leaned on. A blackboard framed thought of that episode in front of class, never easy for a young man. A black and white sky from Fireball XL5. He sang all alone, bones bare for the wind. I wish I was a spaceman, shivering a little through his jacket, a tower of strength like Frankie Vaughan. And I'd walk out the door, some tidy fortune started. Times, remember, stiffened his sandy hair and amusement heroically neatening the curb, eyes that ran in the cold. You're a twig, you are. Attempted bonhomie, money on the waters. Watched him go with a wide grin, with opaque dark eyes. Followed the stiff figure, didn't lose his cockiness. All that rigmarole, young Ames gave a gulp. Ooh, ooh, Nestor-like, shabby waistcoat to much imagination. He tarzaned the gully, alike in their determination. Have you gone crazy? They dug dirt holes, got news of a jump in, cried excitedly, swung from his tree, wove a den of privet. His voice became heated. If anything is up, matchboxes in mud. Tomorrow's Sunday to carry her in. Better hurry, said young Ames, to blow up already. Held his breath. There may be nothing exultant on go-karts. Bring the papers and the seal of the firm. What is bubble and squeak? eating spray at every dip. It terrified him, arguing the toss, his mum decrees, just spinach and potato of a well-danced minuet, spasms of impatience. Not that we eat it, consider wild goosicle. Yet Jean was adamant, short, stiff, deliberate strokes could be bits of everything, any old leftovers. Pay attention to me, wrong but right. Gob a woodbine dangle, bargain, beat down, haggle. Don't give it up easy. His face was stiffening, it almost within his hand. Young Ames had the feeling, materialising out of nothing small and mournful, to empty the scrap baskets, ink, pens and paper. The hairs in the man's ear had ice on them, a foghorn bellow, incredible as it would have seemed, sweating with fear like a part of a machine. As she asked Gobi, do you go by Trump? Red face was back in her red hair to wait out the squall, or pump or blow off. Fancy not remembering, now he nearly cried. Such a clever boy too. 
an anemic gleam of sunlight, low and dun colored like cuttings of white paper, down diagonally, like a side stepping on that eternal bark, suddenly into a clear gray clamor. Heads turn towards young Ames, lime juiced, hog bottom, like a hound slaver over, bitch Gina on heat, must be kept indoors now, down under her belly button, feeble as a duckling's peep, says tummy to me, contrast our cool white walls, sunflowers and salt glaze, a miracle in the crack of doom with a green Chinese girl, mantelpiece of brick brack, heaved lustily on a cabinet ornate on it, using words like get and she's a leggy wench. By dint of practice rose as the side went down, unprecedented among peers, the two came together, a precise compression of time to win the three-legged race, fending off in some fantastic manner, steep companionway, sports day up George V, a crackerjack to start that summer, magically triumphant, give us a corner in recognition of fast passage. Yet in winter, he tightened his muffler, ducked his head, the oldest pipe in the cellar. Outside in the narrows, mostly young Ames's idea, dead set to go to snowball the traffic, he said coldly, inveigled in bad, outraged, snorting breaths. The weather is thickening down by Kettle House, a little bit scared to his dying day, very nearly embalmed himself, scrammed along Norbury, a driver giving chase, sneezed, gasped, crawls under a car, shut the door blindly. He drew a deep breath in hot terror, snow making snakes. The excitement was over, six pence with the crowd, as far as his own part, smelling like a sheep, a hard day's night. His dark face grew thoughtful, chamber pot for one leg on the teetery chair, a memory of Bandywood inching her way in, Hartley Road or Banners Gate in our hip pockets. I wish I had a thousand. He does leave had licorice, spangles, Milky Way, Mars, gobstoppers, flying saucers, Spanish gold, a sugar economy, cross the Mecca threshold, wasting your substance on worn mosaic letters. Shiver premonition, sex, love, death, chilled faint perfume, a piss of cack, and smell the sharp smell, his hand touched pink carbolic in the eyes of bogs and silently through, but often together in circle, to call bottle of poison, and scatter, scram, hot rice or flirters. But at the next light, he didn't know any other words, boldly with older boys, engulfing them both, accepted his hand lightly, watched him toe poke a goal mischievously, awestruck but unseen, the imposter turned into conquering hero. Two to swing down the playground, mind gladsome at break, a centrifugal whim wham not to conform to the tall elm by the gate, those ancient cubicles chant ten, park, drive, kill. On the box, words took hold in his brain for some future stage. You mustn't lose the distance, willing to go, standing in the door. Please understand, Mr. Ames, he burst out laughing, infected by them. My heart would be a fireball. A fireball. And now, just to get my breath back a little bit, uh, and you might have gathered fr from that that Ames, young Ames, was a more exuberant character from me, and that I was rather in awe of him and uh, learned a lot from him. He's a much more streetwise uh, character, even at the age of uh, five, six, seven, eight. Um, so he becomes a hero uh, figure in that poem. I'm now going to read from another sequence, um, and I've read from this before uh, in public on Zoom. Uh, so I'm going to read some of the later pieces, things that haven't been um, tried out yet. It's near completion. It's called Swoon, and it's about um, a duodenal ulcer that I had and was operated on in May uh, 2019. And it details, not too graphically, I hope, the build up to that, the loss of blood, the way that the, the body is actually digesting itself without one well, knowing it. Um, the, the blood leaks into the duodenum uh, and then comes out with the stools. Um, but it's about flow and blockage in more general sense as well. The uh, build up to Brexit, so the flow and blockage of political discourse of uh, capital, of finance, uh, of 
information, the circulation of traffic in a particular area of Swansea, where I was living at the time, the uplands. Um, and it's about swoon in a more general sense as well. Swoon as loss of memory, um, which can be a, a generalized thing, a national thing, a public thing, as well as an individual thing. Um, so perhaps that's enough to, to say by way of introduction. I'm just gonna read some sections from it, it's three parts. Uh, I'll be, begin with a couple of epigrams. Ikadi komi corpo morte cade, that's from Dante's Inferno. Um, and down I felt, felt like uh, uh, one falls as a dead body. Uh, I can't stand up for falling down, Alvis Costello. Awake, emerge, thy head is a lurdy goblet. Raised, it wobbles on its woozy axe excess. Try to not loft it too notably or nobly upwards. Write it, still it, must be cradled, be set down in its weightiness, aligned to planes, this bubble brain spirit leveled. The ulcer opens like an emergency eye and it blinks content in porfor, blackness, knows you had hoped, lacking understanding, I hoped to persuade my blood that I was emperor, that it might fear me. But blood did not believe me. Distrustful blood knew it lodged in a lost man and wanted out. Nothing distracts such bruised insolvency. Wounding deeds bleed and feed inward on a lapsed defiance. A lustrous black A4 file glowers witness to struggles that should be but mad dancing edges. There is a skin too feud, true as your dam said of you, dam too damn touchy by half. Missing love is 300 miles on solaced away and that night saw no moon set. Tune into today, totally capital Westminster punish is meant, O oh, popular ace, electro cash, sloss, Schloss liquidly, butt coin on wheels, hedging all your bits and bobs as Eucania gone, unicornia goads a go go, gaslit into victory, and flat plates, the dead bird in the air blacks out, imprudently pulls up to be mogged in doubloon, Jack Carter, Valuanada, Quito, Hamburg, Tenerife, collapses the market, a pack of pro rogues. Though too easy to say, maybe, in seeking deans to short the jolly, jolly pound against Patria, and now as ever accumulated thusly M C M P L. AK outright step, the rerum natura begins it and proceeds and feeds as follows M C M P over L P C one dash M one. Cycle of hemorrhage of L unpaid is at the rad slow gushing off shore of the vampire body politique all unfallen sustained on bloated tick market to slump and rise in venus veritas returns from creamy foam pressure back in atria aorta restoring a fresh ventricle event and even so so much for your fatuous trickle dumbed down economics the body droops its homeward angle, one low foot on the brink of the other in sick transit among the traffic. Early evening stars pricking out until I must translate the bottom on a gar garden wall, testing for the slant upright just about maintained against some yearned for horizontal and still pig ignorant, teasing the crumbled mortar to hand fingering, flaking off slivers, the pink brick comes, just crumbles away. Just look. Sap in the sun ascends, insults and sets through phloem to transpire. And so the glossed leaves from mottled plains bowls along beechwood richly green it. Incessant vehicles inter and exchange swoop and park in heat to transact. While saws let rip, skips cram plaster board Baths limp, tapless, and fridges gawp affronting front yards. It's all up for grabs, gutted. Almost the entire street is to let. 
and a naked bulb will burn in the upstairs bedroom opposite all summer long forgotten day and night will outshine the season it is a to-do for circulation value added term over only number six gilt in its fanlight resiles behind privet hedge and thinnest lawn hoarding its privacy up the red tiled path set back from goings on in almost dreamful ease enough of action and motion we mild and melancholy go routined poise is a far tang cry reverdy reverie or o'haran tensile whimsy Visions of reconcilement from triumph arise on sand. You may scotch a wretched plot, but its fibres almost invariably will double down. And in that gross gesture, you become your own collateral damage. Slam trespasses in some ironic maiden. Yeah, but no, you may close it upon your own finger. Dante's Inferno, wrong on so many levels. Better then to steady in thy laden head that man with a ghastly wasting disease traversing this street daily, who crabs his metal frame, risks disequilibrium inch by inch of his circuit, tests the root splitted path and uneven curves en route to the news agents and all for the presence of that by which is to be found there. Men, women die miserably each day. Remember, and raise the heart felt faint greeting as you sidestep him, knowing it also to be also a turning from his foul predicament, the keeping of a fearful composure. He too writes poetry. Only poetry can tell the spirit what the body knows better, as Theresa May croaks near the end of her Brexit tether, the way blood loss limits global cerebral perfusion. And Artemisia gentilescu's Esther before Ahasuerus is May in May, croaking at the end of her Brexit tether, like the last great period of the Doggerland hunter gatherers. And in gentilescu's swoon canvas, Esther before Ahasuerus is a sense of sudden motionless throughout all things, like Doggerland in the last great period of the hunter gatherer. Or as Kathy Wilk says, I grieve for things over and over again and a sense of sudden motionless throughout all things suffuses the blue globe my son left behind. It does not spin, as Kathy Wilkes grieves for all things over and over again, as Pamela Anderson visits Assange and calls him an innocent man. With light now suffusing the globe my son left, which cannot spin, which has scraps of dried flowers atop the altar shape, like offerings from Pam Anderson, Anderson telling Assange he is an innocent man, suggesting Elysium is a sort of orthographical relapse or swoon as scraps of dried flowers top the altar shape. Like an offering to all loss, blood loss limits global cerebral profusion as Elysium is a gapping, an orthographical relapse or swoon, and only poetry can tell the spirit what the body knows better. Ah, busily digesting me, a full English that evening across the rolled out red landing carpet to the rear of the property, at the mauve hour of odours and cooking clatter to crawl with motion, the one last pure aim, cohesion, simply to have purpoise, to simply be somewhere sat at, or to the sole desideratum behind an all fours shuffle, Nebuchadnezzar from his den, Sheets and Kelly still bleach white, like up from their pale sprawls to flee the chemic stink and intermediate zone of the John, in reverse gear at the stair, head, sore headed and footing it blindly for each tread and riser, descent in stillicide and gloom to hallway and kitchen table, upright to await dusk's oboles blackly laid on the tired lids of gradually ebbing day, and crimson cells too darkening as they skedaddle along the arse-rope corridor and so boil themselves to black pudding. Always between two stools you fall, out of your standing, the heart of sitting as you cannot stand, the poverty of your substance, caught out in erasure, lapsed, lost, in hemoglobin, coom, 
come with acorn, a copy, and thorn, drain my heart as blood away. As plates lets ghost the tall dresser, gloom eaten into shades, these lines blur also as the word turns in the longing shadows absorbed. Uh, and this one has a title, uh, and it's for Naomi Booth, who's a novelist, works at Durham University, and she has written a novel about induced swooning. And it's called Towards a Taxonomy of Literary Swooning. 1818, the swoon ironic. Louisa Musgrove of Persuasion may be said to have perfected the erotically weaponized swoon, but Jane Austen in Love and Friendship, written back in 1799 when she was just 14, already knew the risks involved in this kind of behavior, having made Isabel advise her friend, beware of swoons, dear Laura, a frenzy fit is not one quarter so pernicious. Run mad as often as you choose, but do not faint. 1844, the swoon comic. Lambs could not forgive, no, nor worms forget. Mrs. Gamp, the gin tippling, snuff stained, garrulous, lying in and laying out, care provider, star turn of Martin Chuzzlewit, who we are informed could perform swoons of different sorts upon a moderate notice, as Mr. Mould does funerals. Sari, an adorable monster, is the one Dickens character who's made me laugh out loud, let me add, although many have made me smile. <clears throat> 1856, the swoon empowering. In Aurora Lee, Elizabeth Barrett Browning spurned Victorian fainting sofas and swoon parlors to wrench swooning into and out of female transfiguration as a poet with impressively understated brilliance. We drop the golden cup at Heres foot and swoon back to earth and find ourselves face down among the pine coals, cold with dew. That just skewiff alliteration of cone and cold is part of the effect, but it's that judiciously undignified face down that clinches it. 1907, the swoon collects conclusive. James Joyce rounds off Dublin as his first book with Gabriel Conroy succumbing with the aid of antimetabole to the blizzard that closes the dead. His soul swooned slowly as he heard the snow falling faintly through the universe and faintly falling like the descent of their last end upon all the living and the dead. These last two, these two last words take us back to the title, just, just, just as surely as Finnegan's Wake finally divulged near the end of Finnegan's Wake, Joyce's last book returns us to its title. In 1979, The Swoon Poignant. In the bloody chamber, in the bloody chamber, in Angela Carter's The Bloody Chamber, we find the nameless heroine swooning, not as a result of the horrors she has discovered, the welter of blood bodies and white lilies hidden behind the forbidden door, but by dint of their impossible to prepare for, wholly mysterious transmutation in the tender gaze the blind piano tuner then turns upon her. And the final uh, new poem from this sequence, The Inner Voice, um, and I'll finish with this. Is this aim a me then? Is this I call, I call? Not with an hysterical heart to inquire this, but with an, it come on down, and down I sank, like to Silenus on an antique vase, and though it wasn't defiance, as such something somewhere may have been doing some defying. Or maybe it was just language per se, nez per se, linked to the literal pulse of the body by its patterns of stress and slack in the placing of words with poetry and intensification such that it knows this stuff all along, always already knows. Loud bleat from that hilly born conspiracy, if you say so, but there's a definite dissolution of borders going on, the flesh cops onto. How does it function, shun funk, whatever? Will me come round again and swoon renew in strength of separation and new spirit life? A sign of strength of feeling grief or love, a power of agency to produce new life out of the shadowy tunnel? Is this what entrails entail, the meta in meat means? Think not. The consciousness grip slips, snap, and is jury rigged and fades, a vague wave stalling, withdrawing weakly. All volume, less substance, the air too thin at those heights. Send the plush 
juice parcel up pronto, quick, kiddo. Make it a fatter vintage, not this semi-skimmed subprime stuff. Charge up the globes and pour it in a glass held rock steady. None of your modish, platitudinous, plenitudinous self would neither. I wasn't unworthy of pity because I suffered this thing and it wasn't a kind of overcome with ecstasy before great art or music, not sweet like Stendhal syndrome, nor what in Berlin they call les nerves. And any new engagement with this world would hurt like crazy and still baffles. Life was drained from me, though I walked with that fear of falling for sure and position nature, you can now let my spirit blood. Thank you very much. That's, that's fantastic, John. Thanks a lot for those um, swooning, swoon, the language swooning at the brink, uh, sort of capturing this fantastic uh, rever de, uh, reveries and others, um, uh, the language of the, the street and of politics and of, uh, and of the body. Um, on the on the, on the political brink as well. That's, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, I just thank uh, all our, all our poets, uh, and uh, it's been it's been great to, to host such such a, a vibrant and uh, lively group of writers um, in the special section uh, in, in Black Box. Uh, do, do have a read of the, the whole section uh, and, and John's great introduction. It's, uh, it's, it's superb. But to, to thank for this evening, uh, Rhea Saren Phillips, Neris Williams, uh, Linda Davis and uh, John Goodby. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, just can I do a, a little bit of shout for, for, for the future uh, Centre of Poetry and Poet Poetics? events. So a couple of things happening in May, which you might uh, be of interest. Um, Dan Eltringham uh, and Zoe Scolding um, are sort of uh, running a, a joint series uh, of uh, talks and events um, uh, uh, looking at poetry and transatlantic translation. Um, and uh, on Monday 17th May at 6 p.m. Um, BST time, uh, we have uh, Pierre Joris uh, and um, uh, joining forces with Ab Abigail Lang of pa Paris Diderot University and Habib um, Tangour uh, from, uh, from Algeria. And uh, we're, uh, th they'll be uh, talking about Atlantic conversations. Um, Dan, do you want to uh, say anything about that? Are you there? Maybe he's not, not here. Uh, he, he was here. Anyway, that's happening. Um, and uh, th th that's, a, that's uh, collaborating between uh, Bangers Contempo uh, Centre and the Centre for Poetry and Poetics here. Um, where also in May, we have the Centre of Poetry and Poetics reading on uh, the 20th, uh, between seven and nine. We have uh, Uli Freer, Carrie Etta, Tim Atkins and uh, Alan Fisher. That's been a, a great evening. So uh, everyone try and make that. Uh, we'll, we'll put a big blast out on um, social media and, uh, and, and everywhere else. Th thanks for everyone for, for turning up. Um, and uh, Aggie, have I forgotten anything? Uh, no, no. Okay, <laughs> I haven't forgotten anything. Okay, uh, th thank you everyone for turning up uh, and uh, just a, a big, uh, huge thanks uh, to, to the poets who read this evening. Fantastic evening. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thanks, yeah. sir. <laughs> I'm gonna stop in the recording now. <laughs>